Um, welcome to the week seven retro. If this is your first retro, firstly, thank you for coming. Um, I know it's a, I know it's an awkward experience to to attempt a quiz a second time, but if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, in in a typical member quiz, we we do sixty cool facts in sixty minutes, and one minute per fact is is incredibly low. So I propose radically that we do two minutes per interesting fact, which may not sound like much, but but it is a hundred percent increase. Uh, this is how the retro happens. We will go quad by quad. We'll uh, share the data from all the matches that took place this week. Uh, we'll find out uh, how much each question was answered. Um, if any of the uh, speakers, that is people who scored three out of four or four out of four in any of the quad, if they're available, then we'll ask you the questions uh, and you can walk us through how you answered them. If people aren't available, then you know, anybody can volunteer. That's fine. Um, we won't be sticking to a time limit today. We'll just take our time. Um, let's just get started. Uh, firstly, let's start with East Asian types of tea. Uh, are Anita or Pranjal on the call? I don't think they are. No, they're not. Okay, cool. So, Eric, you are attempting this. Bubble tea is a Taiwanese specialty, typically a milk-based cold variety that makes use of what edible translucent spheres extracted from a starchy plant. These spheres emerge as a cheaper alternative to Southeast Asian sago. Oba. Oba. Or right. tapioca. Yeah. Or tapioca. Pearls is what we're taking. Your second question. In contrast to matcha tea, this type of Japanese tea is served as a leaf infused into water rather than the powder and is usually grown in the shade rather than the sun. What is this tea? An alternative to matcha that is the most consumed variety of tea in Japan. I can't remember. Somebody answered this in my game, but it's it didn't stick. Okay. Uh, I'll pass you, Shashank. Do you remember? Tencha it was, right? Tencha it was, yes. You know, third question. Although it doesn't actually contain tea leaves, in some cha is considered a herbal tea infusion that is made out of the roots of its titular plants and widely consumed in Korea. What, use, what roots are used in this tea that also finds popular use in folk medicine? The tea is decocted with the roots for several hours over low heat, sweetened with honey, and served with Korean pine nuts. I can't remember this either. Ginger, something like that. Uh, no, I'm not ginger. Uh, Naveen, do you remember? I'm not part of B612. I'm just here to listen to the answers. So I don't have a guess. Uh, that's pretty good because then you get to attempt the questions for the first time. Do you have a guess for this? Uh, uh, folk medicine, right? So is it ginseng? Ginseng is right. Well done. Ginseng. Yeah. And your fourth question, Eric. In China, tea is classified into seven varieties based on its color and texture. One such variety that lies between green and black, sometimes called blue tea is a semi-oxidized green tea produced by withering the plant under the sun and then twisting them. Largely used in the Fujian region of China, what type of tea is this, getting its name from the Chinese for black dragon? Oolong. Oolong is right. That one's like, uh, long is the word for dragon, like Shenlong. So ah. like that's, that's the only way I can figure it out. Oh, uh, did you figure it out based on that? Yeah, yeah. So I was oh. like, it's something long. I was like, Oolong is a type of tea, so. Very nice. Um, so yeah, uh, this is how that played. The L1 and the L4 were in the right place, but Oolong and Ginseng could have been swapped. They're pretty close, actually, so it doesn't make that much of a difference. Uh, okay, for Elemental Haiku, quite a lot of people had Miskiteers, um, which uh, is a good sign. Uh, question for Shashank. Mary Soon Lee is a writer of speculative fiction who has written a collection of poetry titled Elemental Haiku, which describes each element in the periodic table in the form of a haiku. And that this is the sort of thing that is a, a dream for Mimir question setters because we have lots and lots of questions uh, along the same theme. 100 uh, option. Yeah. <laughs> Which metal with atomic number 28 is described in the following manner? Forged in fusion oh, spire, okay. flung out from Nickel, supernova, right. devoted to coins. Yes? Nickel. Nickel is right. In most of the games that I read, uh, the pattern was somebody would guess copper and then get it wrong. And, and then the next person would guess nickel. For this quad, my all, all my first cases were wrong. Oh, shit. So my first was copper and second was nickel. So it's, it's, did, it's this one did not came to me. Mm -hmm. But again, the one which came to me, my first case was wrong. So it's appropriate that you are attempting these questions. Let's see if you can make make up for it. The elemental IQ for which element with atomic number 84 is given here. Hidden in pitch blend gleaned by Marie and Pierre, their radiant child. So the radiant part confused me. I went mm -hmm. with radium, but this is polonium. It is polonium. Yeah. The other popular awesome. guess was uh, Euro, yeah, uranium because of pitch blend. Yeah, because uh, pitch blend has all of, all of those transuranic elements in it, so yes. it makes it difficult. 
Yes, so fishbrain would have both uh, uranium as well as uh, polonium, but only one of those was discovered by, by the SBI. So polonium fits better. Which element with atomic number 80 is described in elemental haiku thus? This is my favorite one. Madness, the price paid for your molten alchemy, metal, planet, god. Easy, easy. Planet because Mercury. Say again, please. This was easy because of planet. Only one planet, Mercury. Is right. This is Mercury. Mercury fits in for quite a lot of the clues. There's madness, there's alchemy, there's god, there's planet, there's metal. There uh, fourth question for Shank. A lesser known use of this element with atomic number 79 is as a coating on the glass of spacesuit helmets to protect astronauts from infrared radiation. Which element is this? Whose elemental haiku is shown below? Deep they delve for thee, yet deeper still thy dwelling in the earth's dark core. This is gold. This is gold, yes. This is a tough one. I don't think the, the clue is super helpful for most people. I think the only way you get it is if you happen to remember <laughs> I, something like this. Only, I, I only got it based on that clue. Like the, the rest of it was not helpful for me at all. So. Um, I, I don't think there's anything here. There's, 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 uh, this could be literally no. any, any mental. Uh, so the only or if you thing, remember, it was 79. Like, yeah, the 79, if, 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 if you've done that. Right? Um, okay, I think I got hard. this one. Okay, that's how uh, this quad pad, nice and uh, uh, elegant little gradient, which is the way we like it. Nice. Uh, question for uh, Naveen now. Um, costumes of children's book characters. Naveen, questions for you. This lady is dressed up as a particularly cruel character from which children's novel written in 1956. The book has since spawned a franchise of media works, including a book sequel called The Starlight Barking. There's not one Dalmatian. That's right. This is how to do missions. The second question. Which children's character, the titular protagonist of a 2002 Hugo Award winning novella, has inspired this girl's outfit? Written over 12 years, the book was adapted into a movie that received an Oscar nod for Best Animated Feature, losing to Pixar's Opera. Which character? Which character? Which uh, I'm going to kick myself. No, I don't know. Pass. Passes to Eric. Coraline. Coraline is it. This is Neil Gaiman's. Neil Gaiman, Gaiman, yeah. Third question for me. This picture shows a girl dressed up as which children's book character featured in the series of books in the 50s. The titular <laughs> character lives in the room on the tippy top floor of the Plaza Hotel in New York City. Not sure. Pass. Passes to Eric. Eloise. Eloise is right. Do you remember the name of the book? Uh, I don't actually. It's Eats Me, or, Eloise. They all have her name in the title. Okay. And fourth question for me. Featuring the trademark red and white stripe, I've generally not been reading this question in entirety. I read till here, at which point I assume the scene in the photo. Yes, and it's Waldo, right? Well, Waldo, Waldo, right? Yes. Okay. I like how you also included Where's Wally, which is probably smart. Uh, yeah, they, I, I'm sure there must, be, must have been a couple of people who, who who recognize this term but don't recognize Where's Waldo. Yeah. So it happens. Is it in India? Is it Waldo or Wally? I have actually, I mean, in my old childhood, I never really came across these books at all. This is just something I know from pop culture. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know how they're published in India. If anybody knows, you know. uh, for zero mile markers, nobody got a musket, but quite a few uh, musketeers. Anybody wants to volunteer to join Eric for this? I don't know. Um, I don't know who I is. Lupa. So. Lupa. Question for Lupa and Eric. Several countries have a zero mile marker or kilometer zero, a specific point from where the country's distances are measured. Which present day country's zero mile marker lies at the center of the Menlik, the second square and the capital city? The, cap the statue at the center is of the namesake emperor depicted in victory at the Battle of Adwa, which thwarted European colonization of his people during the scramble for Africa. Ethiopia, right. This yeah. Okay. So do they want the country? Or this? Yeah. Yes, they want the country, right. Yeah, so Ethiopia. Okay. Second question for Nupal. The Millennium Aurium, or the Golden Milestone, was the historical zero mile marker in the city located in the Forum. The modern day marker is nearby atop the capital lane. In which present day country do all roads lead to this marker? I got this because of the clue. 
Italy, Rome, all Rome. Yeah, Italy, right? At some at some point, I have to card all the seven hills of Rome, but I haven't done it yet. So, I had a couple of people who guessed who who recognize that last clue and and therefore guessed Rome instead. Uh, question for question for Rupa. Um, this monument is a zero mile marker in Way Island, which is the northernmost island in the country. The color scheme of the sign also pays tribute to the national flag. Which present day country are we talking about, Rupa? Indonesia. Indonesia, is right? Yeah, I guess, I guess Malaysia anyway. for this one. So. And fourth question for Rupal. Which present day country's kilometer zero lies at the Jaffa Gate? This gate is one of seven gates that are entry points to the world old city in the capital. Jaffa is yes, there. Yeah. It says yeah. seven gates, this is Jaffa. There are quite a lot of clues. This is right. Yeah. Okay. Let's see how we did. Uh, Indonesia turned out to be harder than Ethiopia. I wonder why. Uh, I would have thought Ethiopia would be much harder. And I am surprised by that. I don't know why that happened. Oh, with, with Ethiopia. Indonesia has a you... color clue, right? Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Indonesia has a flag clue. So yeah, if so you know it... the flag, then you can... Work exactly. It so it should be should, should be easier, no? but instead it's harder. So it's the hardest I think someone, someone mentioned in our quiz that uh, Ethiopia was the only country that wasn't colonized or one yeah. or two that and colonize and that was specifically mentioned so maybe that played easier oh. also like metal like an Ottawa known clues for Ethiopia okay. I recognize that voice so this next chat will be for Chitaj and Shashank first question for you it says Mathilde Nista Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the early royal patrons of this brand established in 1847 King Edward VII gave it the moniker the king of jewelers and the jeweler of kings and from the Maharaja of Patiala to Kate Middleton its legacy of adorning royalty is intact Identify this luxury brand presently owned by the Swiss Sichman Group. Did it? Yeah, I, I think I remember this. It should be Cartier. Cartier is right. Your second question Shandur is the world's highest ground for what has been termed as the uh, king of sports and the sport of kings. Which sport is this with origins in 6th century BC, usually played by teams of four each, and whose modern form developed in India? Yeah, this was. Polo and for some reason, without looking at the field, I was going to guess Kabaddi for this, but luckily somebody else answered this in our quiz. <laughs> this is Polo. I had no idea Polo was just played by four people on each side. It seems kind of less, but uh, question for Shitish. Alexander the Great, Charlemagne, Henry the Eighth, and Queen Victoria all suffered from the king of diseases and the disease of kings, traditionally believed to derive from the excesses of, of rich lifestyles. This disease has no proper cure, but modern medicine can treat it thanks to research stemming from Emil Fischer's Nobel Prize winning efforts. Name this disease, which gets its name from the Latin for drop. Yeah, my guess was diabetes, but this is actually gout. Ah, this is gout. And question for you is that again. The hotel above, this was the last question on the set. The hotel above is where he made his name before accusations of fraud caused him to leave. The hotel below would become his second iconic home. He introduced Edward the Seventh to frog's legs as a delicacy, treated George the Fifth to cream cheese, and delighted Kaiser William the Second with salmon doused in champagne. When the Kaiser asked him what he wanted in return, the man said, "Give us back Alsace Lorraine." Name this king of chefs and chef kings. Shashank, please help. This was August Escoffier. It's like this is Escoffier. And here's how that happened. Uh, Shitej is not alone in not remembering a uh, It was the hardest question in the set, even though we thought it might be slightly easier than well. He, he is the like proto Ramsay, right? He's the, Say again, right? please. He's the proto Gordon Gordon Ramsay, the you know strict chef and all. Oh, okay. I, I've never heard him describe that way, but cool. Uh, need a volunteer for this next set. This is for Fritz Lang's newspaper Noah trilogy. I like this. Um, Bindu, can I add you for this? Yeah, sure. First question for you. Fitzlang's 1953 Hollywood film, The Blue Gardenia, sees Anne Baxter blacking out after striking a man making advances on her. She wakes up elsewhere to learn that he has been murdered and the police are looking for the killer. The press sensationalizes the story by giving an epithet to the murderer, which real-life murder from that era was the film taking a pot shot at in terms of plot as well as the film's name. It's like Black Dahlia, right? Uh, question is for Bindu. Uh, yeah. There was a black dahlia, right? Black dahlia murders or something. 
that, that is right. This is this is the yeah. Black Dahlia word. Yeah, also, uh, it's a Brian De Palma movie, I think. Which is okay. the... Second question for Naveen Anmuduk. The final American film directed by Fritz Lang was a 1956 film about Dana Andrews working with his father-in-law, a press magnate, to train himself for a murder and expose the hollowness of circumstantial evidence and the death penalty. The film's title is a four-word phrase of importance to juries and judges. It is the most important condition to be met while concluding that a person is guilty. In the film, or you can also just give me the last two words. Uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt. Absolutely right. This is beyond reasonable doubt. Nice. And third question for Amin Amidu. It's Lang's 1956 Hollywood film about a serial killer focuses on how the succession battle after a media mogul's death is contingent upon who can get the story and find out the killer's identity. The film's title, blank, 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 is a phrase used to refer to the dead of night in urban areas. That is when the killer operates and the press rushes against time to finalize stories in the film. Uh, Naveen, any guesses? No, I don't know. I'm just trying to think. Uh, second word could be and or the and uh, can't be. Uh, Murder at the Orient Express. I don't know. Is it that? So I give you. I can give you one word. Yeah, I think you got it already. Uh, urban would be the four-letter word is city. City. Uh, Anything? No. No. Okay. We'll have to pass. Shank and Shudish. Yeah, you know? I remember this. Yes. Uh, it is while the city sleeps. While the city sleeps, is right? While the city sleeps. Nice, very nice. Can, can I just come in here? You know, whoever yes, wrote this question, I think this is the most beautifully phrased question in the whole quiz. Uh, okay. None of us got it in our, uh, in our uh, round, but, you know, there was a collective uh, applause at the end of it. <laughs> uh, the setter of this question is also on the call. It is, as you expect, it is though. Uh, well done, Dhruv. Like another elegantly framed question. Uh, fourth question for Naveen and Nidu. Fritz Lang's films, The Blue Gardenia, While the City Sleeps, and Beyond Reasonable Doubt are collectively referred to as his blank, blank trilogy, referencing the common fact in all the films and the film genre. Clean the two blanks, which are alliterative. The image is all you need. Naveen, maybe you should try this. I think you already called uh, it I, the I, newspaper I, noir. I was hoping that you didn't remember, but you are right. It is uh, newspaper <laughs> noir. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This is one of those things where I can only tell you the quad title after uh, uh, the question is already over. Correct. Yeah. So I, I think you had the newspaper part. So the other second half would have been yes. up for guessing. But yeah, nice. No, no, they're both uh, newspaper. No, the whole answer is that one. No, 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 no. I'm saying if I had not known, the, hmm. the picture definitely shows the newspaper. So the first word can okay. be guessed. The second word. Okay. The second and word. The genre also, you had already. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Fine. Fair okay. Okay. Uh, so this is how that quad played. Newspaper Noir, we thought would be the easiest one. It wasn't. Uh, it was harder than the Black Dahlia murder. While the city sleeps is expectedly slightly different. I, I rarely get to hear uh, compliments for a question that's basically marked as L4 that gets only nine answers in the whole league. Uh, uh, I, I rarely get to hear nice things about that question. So particularly good framing there. Um, okay. Who wants to attempt a train journeys via songs? Anybody? Too few people with the ah, cameras on, so I can't even put people in. <laughs> mm, should I put who do I know? Um, Jing, I'm putting you. Okay. okay. First question for you. He hears the train coming around the bend and then rolling on down to San Antonio. But as the train comes and goes, where does the singer of this song find himself stuck? A venue the artist later performed the song at. When asked how he came up with a now famous line from the song, the writer said it was simply the worst reason a person could have for killing another person. This was a Folsom Prison, right? It is, it is Folsom Prison. This is the Johnny, uh, Cash, the Johnny Cash song. Do you remember the line? Uh, the line oh, uh, I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. Just to watch him die, yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, second question. This is for Jing. 
uh, there's not a train that would go the whole way. The most logical way would be to leave LA, the train travels to New Orleans, and then you would connect to for the remainder of the trip to this location. An Amtrak official confirmed that no such journey was actually possible in 1973, particularly with no trains running at 12 a.m. Where was this train headed? As per the Grammy Award-winning song, a southern U.S. state that's also on Ray Charles' mind. Jing? This one for me? Oh, it's yes. uh, Georgia. Georgia is right. So, Georgia on my mind is the Ray Charles song, and Midnight Train to Georgia is the Gladys Knight song. Third question for you, Jing. These days, the Al Burak fast train will speedily get you across most of the northern cities in the country. But to get to this mystical city in the central area, with charming cobras at the square and striped libas to wear at home, you'll still have to take a slow train like Single Graham Nash did as per this 1969 song. Which African city is he heading to as per this song? I remember this one. Uh, I forgot. I think it's somewhere in Morocco. Yeah, I think I think I, it's I forgot it the Marrakech. answer. I think it was Marrakesh. It is, it is Marrakesh. The song is called yeah. Marrakesh Express. That was interesting. I didn't know that one when I when we played. And the fourth question for Jing. Uh, leaving the Pennsylvania station about a quarter to four, leading a magazine until Baltimore, some ham and eggs in Carolina, all aboard the Titler Express, to which location as per this 1942 Glenn Miller song? I would love for someone to get this who who did not get it in the legitimate in the actual quiz. I think somebody else got it in the quiz, mm. but I, I knew it at the time, so I'll abstain. Mm. Not sure I can remember this either. Okay, we'll pass. Naveen and Bindu? Bindu, you have a guess? Uh, no idea. Okay. No idea. It, yeah. is, it is a tough one. Um, pass is Ben to Shashank and Shitish. I don't remember. Chattanooga, right? Chattanooga yeah. is right, yes. Oh, yeah. The song was called Chattanooga Choo Choo. And uh, once again, I understandable why none of you got it. Uh, only 11 answers in the whole week. This is the hardest question in the set. And once again, you can see Marrakesh was actually easier than Fulton Prison Blues, which is kind of unexpected. Uh, on paper, it, um, does anybody want to join Shashank and Shitish for this? I will be adding. Mamsi, I'm adding you. First question for you, Mamsi. With literacy rates increasing in France between 1825 and 1848, the middle class took to exchanging written critiques of the monarchs Charles X and Louis Philippe. As a result, what useful tabletop product started being produced at a greater scale now that desks had lots of sheets on them? The aristocrats still used intricate ones, including one called the Basket of Flowers, which auctioned for $258,000 in 1990. I don't know, man. What could it be? If you if you don't know, you'll just have to pass. We don't have any other choice. <laughs> paperweights, paperweights, paperweights. It is paperweights, you're right. Nicely cracked. Questions from say again. When, as a lieutenant, he and his 11-member crew were stranded on an island in 1943, which future president used a coconut shell to inscribe a distress message and send it via native residents to a nearby coast watcher leading to his rescue? The inscribed coconut shell fragment was then encased in plastic, mounted to a wood base, and used as a paperweight in the Oval Office. JFK? JFK is right. There's actually not much in this question by way of clues. Like, it just says future president. That's that's about it. Well, the whole PT-109 episode is pretty famous. But, oh, okay. I mean, to, to us, I guess it is famous. Yeah. I don't know how famous it is internationally. Question for Wamsi. Which colorless diamond, also known as... Oh, this is appropriately going to Wamsi, because I think Wamsi is the only one in the whole league who got this answer, right? Uh, which colorless diamond... Kidding? I'm kidding. <laughs> so, which colorless diamond, also known as the Imperial or Victoria Diamond, 80 grams when uncut and now 36 grams, was used by the last Nizam of Hyderabad as a paperweight for a long time. The Indian government... This is the Jacob Diamond. Is correct. This is the Jacob Diamond. Now, please uh, enlighten us, please. How, how do you know this? I don't know, man. I, I'm from Hyderabad, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, and your fourth question. The mid-19th century French company Pantene is famous among collectors for rare paperweights containing reptiles like salamanders. One of its paperweights contains three silkworms as a tribute to which French scientist who won the Copley Medal for his work on silkworm diseases and fermentation. He also developed vaccines against anthrax and rabies and co-founded the Alliance Francais. Uh, this is Louis Pasteur? That's correct. This is Louis Pasteur. And here's how that played. Okay, not the only one. There are two people who got that. Yeah. One of them is Wamsi. I don't know who the other one is. Okay. Um, I think that's interesting. And I think this is everybody's favorite word. Uh, 
Oh, so take this. Do we have any of the musketeers here? Shashank is here. Yeah. Shashank, I'm putting you also in this team just so you can experience this twice. Uh, you will hear the theme music from an Oscar winning score from a 1960 Paul Newman film based on a best selling book set largely in Israel. Decades later, in the 90s, the music was reworked slightly to create a piece of music for one Kurt Hennig for his immaculate use every week. Shashank, you have to identify the film. Oh, film was Exodus. Exodus is right. And what was the uh, use? Kurt Hennig is Mr. Perfect. Yes, right. This is Mr. Perfect. Hence the uh, immaculate use. So Mr. Perfect came into your week. You mean... Your second like question? If you know about... WWE it's a bit confusing really? because the, yeah because uh, Bret Hart is excellence of execution. So not quite the same you, thing as immaculate though. Yeah. Okay. Second like, question: This 1856 Wagner composition has been reinterpreted on the electric guitar and used as the WWE entrance theme for a very popular wrestler since the 2010s, known for his yes chants. You can either name the wrestler or name the piece that you'll hear. Which references the titular characters from Norse mythology moving through the skies. Once again, you have to tell me. So, I ride of the Valkyries, right? Yes, right. This ride is of the Valkyries. Some the one guy in my quiz uh, went like flight of the Valkyries, rise of the Valkyries. Oh no. Just... <laughs> what's the who's the wrestler? Uh, this is Daniel Bryan or Brian Danielson. Yes, right. This is Daniel Bryan or Brian <laughs> Brian Danielson. Question for Navi. Uh, Naveen Bindu Shashank, uh, listen to this 1901 composition, a watch number one by a British composer. You can either name the piece or name, actually you have to name the piece. A piece yeah, this play it, no? play it, no, at least. All oh, right, sorry, sorry, I forgot you Naveen, that you, uh, this is the first time you've seen this question, sorry. You don't play any of it, you have not played anything, I'm seeing the question. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. Circumstance by Absolutely right. This is Pomp and Circumstance. Do you know the very manly wrestler who made it his theme? This is Macho Man Randy Savage. Correct. Yes. This is Macho Man Randy Savage. And the last question in this set, I'll play the clip and this is only for Naveen. Uh, this piece was composed in 1740 by James Thompson and some people mistake it to be the country's national anthem or confuse it with the actual anthem. You can either name the piece or identify the canine ring name of Davy Boy Smith, who used it as his WWE theme in the nineties. British Bulldog is uh, Davy Boy Smith. That's the second part. But the yes, first part, right. you can play the piece. Okay, I'll play it and you can identify this. Is it, is it Rule Britannia? It is Rule Britannia. Well done. I like that quote a lot because you can either know it from the wrestling or from actually having listened to those pieces, which I think is great. Yeah, it, it is two extremely different ways of getting points in the same court. Okay, this so, squad has officially won the week for me because it's the best squad for me. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is very, very unusual. And if you want, do you want to guess who made it? You? You no. made it? No, no. It's it's Drew. It's always Drew. Um, okay, well, uh, move on. Question for uh, my favorite entrance theme, classical ent entrance theme, is called Entrance of Gladiators. If you okay. can find and play it, you can. Uh, maybe some other because time. it is very funny. If you can okay. just find and play it's it. Do Doing the Clown has that, right? Doing the Clown. Yes. Right? It's the clown theme. It's called Entrance of the Gladiators. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It is the circus clown theme. Okay, uh, next word is gladiatorial styles. Uh, we'll stick to three people, Eric, Nupal, and Jing. This is for you. There were different types of gladiators in ancient Rome, each specializing in specific weapons and fighting techniques. A gladiator who had earned his freedom but still remained involved in fights as a trainer or referee was, was called a rudiaris. They got the name from a piece of equipment called a rudy, a dummy version of a real weapon that they received as a symbolic gesture of their freedom. What was a rudy, which could really only be used for practice gladiator combat? Wooden sword. Wooden sword. Is right. This is a wooden sword. Uh, question for Eric Nupanjing. Altarius was a lightly armed gladiator equipped with a trident, a small dagger, and what other bit of equipment, which was usually weighted to make it more effective. The Tarius gladiators were associated with the water theme due to their use of a trident, which is symbolic of Neptune, and also because of this bit of equipment, which you typically associate with water in a non-combat context. 
Who's it? Net. 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 Yeah. Net is right. And third question. An Acidarius was a type of Roman gladiator introduced after Caesar's wars in Britain, where he saw these soldiers fighting against him. What special equipment were Acidarius gladiators permitted to use? It would have improved the gladiator's speed and also made for an impressive entry into the arena. Statues of the British Queen Boudicca often depict her using this equipment. Chariot. Yep, yeah, chariot. Chariot mounted gladiators. And the last question of this set. A cestus gladiator was a type of boxer who did not wear any other armor or accessory aside from a cestus, which translates to a to striker and was worn on the fighter's hands. It is thus similar to what modern day fighting accessory, which despite one of its common names, can be made of a variety of materials. Instead of three of you, you need to give me three different terms for this. <laughs> uh, I'll use the I'll try to use the obscure one. Knuckle duster. Knuckle duster is one. Shirank. Oh, sorry, no put. Uh, Jing, if you want to name one, you can. I don't think I can remember anything else. Yeah, okay. brass knuckles. Yeah. Brass knuckles, one of the two. Yeah, uh, knuckle duster, knuckle busters, simply knuckles or knucks. Uh, brass oh. knuckles is the most common one. Also, English punch, which I thought was an interesting one, and iron fist. Mm. Okay, uh, here's how that played. Not much difference between them. This could have been a, uh, an honest ending call, it would have been perfect, but nothing really apart from that. Uh, movies set in theater. Question for Shang, Shitaj, and Mamsi. While many movies are adapted from the theater, some are set in the world of theater. In this Academy Award winning 2014 film, Regan Thompson mounts an intimate Broadway production of Raymond Carver's What We Talk About When We Talk About Love. Constructed to look like a single two hour take, which movie is this that also uses previous roles of its lead actor, Michael Keaton, to, to express its own opinion of superhero films? Shang, Shetaj, Jwamsi, anybody can answer. There's a Birdman. Uh, I'll prompt you for the full title. I can't remember the full title. I'll see if I can get somebody to give me a full title. I'll pass you. Naveen Bindu Shashank. I assume that's a pass since nobody's saying anything. Eric no pulling drink. It seems mean to call that an X, so I'll give it to you. This is Birdman or the Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. Oh, wow. Obviously, we were just accepting Birdman. Uh, question for Shashank and Shitaj and Mamsi. Springtime for Hitler, a gay romp with Adolf and Eva at Bursch's Garden. This is the title of the play that forms the central plot of which cult 1967 black comedy film by Mel Brooks. Aiming to put up this stage musical mocking Nazism, the titular characters aim to come up with the worst possible musical they can create as part of a scam. Can I answer this? I don't know who I is, but yes. Uh, this is to be or not to be. It's not to be or not to be. Uh, uh, sorry. Mel Brooks, huh? Producer. Producer is right, yes. So it says, yeah. uh, it says titular characters aim to come up with the worst possible musical, so producers fits better. Right. Question for Shank, Shitaj, and In which 2008 psychological drama do we follow theater director Kaden Cotard, who finds his life unraveling after a successful production of Death of a Salesman? In trying to make a production that's extremely realistic, the boundaries between real and fiction begin to blur. The film's title is a play on the district where it is set, replacing the first word with a type of figure of speech. I was very happy to find out the the logic behind the na name of the film. This was Synecdoche, New York. Right. I did not know it at the time, but deeply satisfying to know this. I, you know, my reaction was exactly the same. I, I have heard of this before. I have, I know that yeah, there but is it some... made no sense. Yeah. Until until somebody pointed out that there is that area in New York. Yeah. yeah. Great. Question for Shrank Shetaj In which Oscar nominated 2021 Japanese film does the protagonist Yusuke get hired to launch a multi million dollar production of Anton Chekhov's play Uncle Vanya? The main focus is to showcase how art can help communicate across divides, especially between Yusuke and Misaki, who is hired to do the titular duty. Uh, drive the car. Say again, please. Drive the car. Uh, not exactly that, but do you want to correct that? The second word is drive the just... car. Drive the car. It's drive my car. I'm still giving it to you. It's drive my car. I don't it's know a... it. I I don't know. Yeah, it's a reference to a Beatles song, incidentally. They have okay. a song called Drive My Car. Uh, okay, question. Uh, this is how that got played. 
Uh, it is actually an, uh, uh, a decent gradient, but all too close to really make a difference. For modern virtues, um, question for Naveen Dindu and Shank. The floor of the National Gallery of UK in London is filled with large mosaic artworks by Paulus Andrep. Which national leader does Andrep depict as the embodiment of the virtue of defiance? Dindu? Uh, I have no clue. Uh, Naveen Shashank. Churchill. Churchill is right. That, that person is Churchill. Second question for you. Uh, as part of the mosaic artwork, The Awakening of the Muses in the National Gallery, which writer does Boris Andrew depict as Cleo, the muse of history? Bindu Shishank, either if you can answer. Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf is right. The third question is part of the mosaic artwork, The Modern Virtues on the floor of the National Gallery, which mathematician and philosopher does Boris Andrew depict as the embodiment of the virtue of lucidity? Is it Einstein? It's not Einstein. Eric Nupal Jing. We're trying to wrestle. Russell, Russell is right. And your fourth question, uh, as part of the mosaic artwork, The Awakening of the Muses, which non-British actress does Boris Hunter depict as Melpomene, the muse of tragedy? Bindu Shashank, either if you can answer. Greta Garbo. Greta Garbo. Greta Garbo was the hardest one, uh, only 16 answers in this whole week. Uh, and Bernard Russell was significantly easier than his RTP, but this could have been an L2. Uh, commissions from Indian history. This is for Eric Nopal and Jing. After Burma had been annexed by Britain, it was merged with, of course, this, uh, I, I think we should just uh, take it for granted that this entire quad is for Eric now. Um, after Burma had been annexed by Britain, it was merged with British India, and the Burmese felt a sense of neglect from the British authorities. This was cemented by the appointment of the blank blank in 1927 to examine the state of constitutional reform. The resulting tensions led ultimately to the Saya Khan Rebellion. Which appointed body was this, well known in India due to famous protests in the 1920s, which in turn led to the death of Lala Ajpant Rai? Can I answer yeah. this? Yeah, please yeah. do. I can't remember. Go for it. Uh, the Simon Commission. Is right. This is the Simon Commission. Uh, second question for Eric and Aritro. Uh, the report of a famous one-man commission begins thus. The assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi on 31st October 1984 by her two Sikh security guards led to violent attacks on Sikhs and their properties in Delhi and other parts of the country. Not to be confused with the prominent murder case from the, from the late 50s, what is the common name for this commission? Yeah, I'm Eric. forgetting Eric, go for it. I can't remember either. <laughs> Uh, is, is it Nupal Jing, I you remember? No. Okay, we'll pass you. Naveen Bindu Do you remember? Nanavati. Nanavati, is right? Nanavati, yes. Third question for uh, Eric and Aditro. Which explosive Indian government report submitted in 1980 relied on the following criteria to make its observations? Low social position in traditional Hindu hierarchy, lower level of education, Lower participation in government and lower participation in industry. Should be the Mandal Mandal Commission. This is the Mandal Commission. And your fourth question. In 2005, the blank committee was set up by PM Manmohan Singh to investigate the economic and social status of Muslims as a minority in India. Multiple controversies surrounded the report, including its comments on high birth rate of Muslims compared to Hindus. The Gujarat government even went on to describe the report as unconstitutional. Which controversial committee are we talking about? I don't know this. I can't remember. Uh, Nupal Jing, do either of you remember? No. I'll pass you Shashank Shitish from six. This is the Sachar Committee. Sachar Committee, sure. right. Mm. Let's see what happened in that quad. Sachar was the hard, was, okay, I think we're, we're on to the last three. That's okay. These are non descending quads because there's no way we would have thought Sachar is the L2, but these are the non descending quads. Uh, this is oh, this is frozen. 
I guess I'll come back to it. Uh, question for Shashank Sripajan Vamsi. This is in the mutual fund squad. USA Mutuals has a mutual fund called the Blank Fund, which invests in the stocks of companies whose products are considered socially irresponsible, traditionally in the sectors of liquor, gambling, and tobacco. The portfolio includes Galaxy Entertainment Group, Nasser Fuhrman, Benoit Ricard, uh, Diago, and British American Tobacco, among others, all of which US Mutuals calls a blank stocks fill either of the two blanks. Uh, no one's going for it. It's a uh, vice. Give me both, please. It's vice. Uh, sin. Vice and sin. Vice and sin is right. The second question: The Moneta Blank Blank Fund, or the or YI, invests fifty percent of its assets in ETFs and index funds. The remaining fifty percent is put only into companies that are well known to their intended target audience for the fund. In July two thousand and seven, the fund declared that every new investor opening an account or celebrating a birthday that month would receive a free Happy Meal. What does the Y I stand for? Uh, young investor, I really like that Happy Meal. Uh, like, I, I want a, I want a Happy Meal for investing. It sounds great. After making this question, I suddenly felt like having a Happy Meal again. It's been years. <laughs> question for Shankar Jamal. Happy Meal like what again? This CarX mutual fund might seem like a dream for racing enthusiasts, but in reality, most of the holdings are only tangentially related to the racing circuit. In fact, most companies are selected simply because they happen to sponsor teams at racing events. What is SCAR an abbreviation of? A term that originally meant an automobile that has not been modified from its factory configuration. Can I answer this? Yes, please. Stock car auto racing. Stock car is right. I remember guessing. NASCAR for this after a lot of deliberation and I I clarified that I meant nascent car nascent and I was very, I'm very proud of it even though it's horribly wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you should be proud of that nascent car is a very very creative guess. Uh, fourth question for Shankar Tejan Ramsey: The Hurstfield Carbon Basin Fund is a long-term horizon fund which, as the name suggests, invests in companies that have a strong presence in countries of the Caribbean basin. The fund is betting on a once-in-a-lifetime event which they believe will cause the share prices of these companies to balloon. What event is this proposed in the form of a resolution by the UN every year since 1992, but repeatedly vetoed? Alternatively, what is the four-letter ticker symbol for this fund? Uh, Cuba fund. Yep, Cuba was. Uh, event being uh, the lifting embargo. Yes, the lifting of the US embargo against Cuba. Uh, I think I guessed Puerto Rican independence, which was not a the, good guess. But... The question seems pretty opaque, but once the answer gets revealed, I think a lot of people yeah. respond by right. saying, "Oh, yeah, that is very rude." Agreed. Um, U.S. embargo was the hardest one of that. Uh, stock car was next. Not entirely unexpected. And the last squad for today. This is for Navin Bindu and Shank. Uh, we'll be doing arrows and logos. Arrows are a common logo motif used by many brands to showcase values like progression, innovation, or speed. Across twelve redesigns of its logo from nineteen nineteen onwards, one element has remained the same: the double arrow, inspired by a milling gear shown in the image here. Which French auto company's logo is inspired from this? Almost an inversion of Chevron's logo placed inside an oval. Should be Renault. It's not Renault. Eric Topolji. Um, um, sorry, I I, I, I should have guessed. Guess. That's fine. Then none of this matters. Yeah. Uh, uh, Eric Topolji. It... Uh, yeah, Bindu, you want to try again? Yeah. Is it Citroen? Citroen is right. Yes. Mm. That's what that logo looks like. Thanks. Uh, question for Navin Bindu Shrag. The arrows in the logo of this company don't feature in the name itself, but in the tagline below, leading, reading a leading innovation. The arrows resemble a fast forward button, which is apt considering the products that the company manufactures. Which Asian brand uses this triple grey arrow motif to represent its desire to build futuristic products? Uh, this is Toshiba. Toshiba is right. Nice. In one of the quizzes I read, somebody got this by thinking, which company would have such a lame tagline? <laughs> <laughs> Leading innovation is one of the worst taglines you can think of. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Third, third question. Uh, the arrows in this brand's logo represent the different directions one can take from a crossroad. Also, the inspiration for the brand's name itself. Which brand's logo is this that cleverly hides the C within the logo while also using the French national colors? This is Care Four. Care Four is right. Care Four. And the last question for today's set. Every element in this logo is a tribute to speed, be it its sharp red arrow screaming uh, forward or the overall bird-like feel. A major part of F1 races till 1977. What brand's logo is this stylized into an arrow? Uh, this is Dunlop. 
I lost this right. And that completes today's set. Let's quickly take a look at the numbers for this. The hardest one was Toshiba, which is a little surprising. But I suppose all the others are too easy to show sure over there. But yeah, that's that ends today's set. Thank you, folks. And uh, nice. I, uh, I apologize for, for eliminating you from, from the league, but we do this for exactly one week in the whole season. Um, yeah, the, the final week starts uh, tomorrow. And, and if you aren't uh, in the league, please feel free to sign up to read those games because, uh, you know, we can always use more readers. How do you know if you qualified or not? Um, if you were in the top two of your game, then you qualified. Okay. Um, and, and the draws will show. So you can actually check the draws immediately. So the uh, draws, uh, we've been updating them all through the week. So you can already see whether you, yes. your name shows up on the side or not. Okay, cool. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Armin. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Yeah.